Okay, let's start. Welcome to our first issue briefing of the World Economic Forum on Africa 2016. Great to see so many people here on day one. The format and the purpose of these issue briefings is they're 30 minute short sessions. We hope they're high impact. We hope they tackle some of the tougher issues that we discuss here at the meeting. We hope they inspire blunt talking and a bit of interaction and exchange between you, the audience, and, and, and the panel here. We're going to try to keep things as interactive as possible. I'll briefly introduce my panel, and then let's get cracking. My name, Oliver Kahn. I work for the public engagement team here at the Forum. Winnie Bianima, Executive Director, Oxfam International. Great friend. Great to see you here again, Winnie. Thanks for joining us. My colleague, Jennifer Blanke, Chief Economist at the World Economic Forum, who is going to be hopefully talking a little bit about the inclusive growth angle that we do here and chipping in, as I'd expect, in the, the wider debate. I'm very pleased to be joined as well by Gilbert Fosun Huangbo, Deputy Director General, Field Operations and Partnerships of the ILO, previously Prime Minister of Togo between 2008 and 2012, um, served also in the private sector, hopefully bringing, uh, bringing insights and perspectives from somebody in policy and in business who's actually tried tackling inequality, actually trying putting in place policies, hopefully share some of your, some of your experiences. I suppose we're not in a happy place. We've been reporting about income inequality and the Global Risk Report for years and years, at least since 2009, I believe. Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong. We, do, we talk about it a lot of these meetings. And we, it sounds like we're not getting very far. We're still here. I'd love to, for us not to have a conversation on inequality. Winnie, you have a, a, you know, a strong position. We all know your reports are getting great traction in the press. You've been working hard, I imagine, since January. How can we take this debate forward? How can we actually think that we're moving in the right direction? Thanks. Oli, it's a pleasure to be here with you again. And my colleagues, Gilbert and Jennifer. Oxfam has just released a report. We call it The Time Is Now, and it's about tackling inequality in Africa. At Davos in January, we released another report where we showed that the world's 62 richest billionaires now own more wealth than the poorest 50% of the world put together, 3.6 billion people. We have a global economy that's working for a small elite at the top and that is at the expense of the majority. Wealth is not trickling down. On the other hand, income and wealth are flowing upwards at a frightening rate. Here Afri in Africa, this is the second most unequal region in the world, next to Latin America. Six out of 10 most unequal countries in the world are African. The most unequal country in the whole world is South Africa. And the rate at which wealth is being accumulated at the top and poverty is increasing at the bottom is alarming. The number of African billionaires has, has doubled since 2010. The number of poor people has increased by 50 million since 1990. Equatoria Guinea, an African country has a per capita income the same as that of Spain, it's as rich as Spain, but it has a child mortality rate as low as Burundi. These are shameful facts. The IMF likes to compare Vietnam with Mozambique. In the last 10 years, they were achieving the same levels of growth, same rate of growth. Vietnam was able to use that growth to create two million jobs through industry, as well as millions of other jobs in agriculture, in agribusiness, through supporting small-scale agriculture. Mozambique created 160,000 jobs. That is how African growth is structured. It is being captured by a few and leaving the majority of our young people without jobs, without livelihoods. But it doesn't need to be like this. African countries can do something about it. And Oxfam says that now that growth has slowed, we are at 3% lower than the global average for the first time in a number of years, it's a wake up call. And that wake up call should not mean that a smaller budget means cut social spending, cut health, cut education, bring the private sector to deliver education. No. 
maintain investments in education and health because that is the most important way that you will reduce inequalities and bring back that link again between growth and poverty reduction. Free quality primary and secondary education, free health are not things to cut or to negotiate around. Maintain those investments at all costs and keep them publicly provided. The temptation to bring the private sector in is a wrong one to be resisted. Then we ask African governments to invest in agriculture, small scale agriculture. That is the starting point. That is where Africa has some comparative advantage and where the majority of adults work, working people are. The investment in agriculture is critical. But again, we're seeing that the attention is towards big agribusiness, not the empowerment of small scale agriculture, women, farmers, increasing their productivity, linking them to markets, research and development to help them. No, it's more about let's bring in the big business. They will do it for us. That's not proven. It's risky. It takes the risks from the top, passes the risks to the bottom, and just maximizes profits that go out. So there's every reason to be optimistic for the future of Africa. Why? Because our evidence shows that the resources are there. The resources are there but are not being collected because Africa is cheated through illicit financial flows, tax dodging, and harmful tax competition. If Africa can tackle those, there are huge resources available to maintain these important investments that will generate growth. $14 billion, $14 billion of tax revenue could be collected from the wealth of rich Africans that is hidden offshore. That is an estimate we have made. $14 billion, that could save the lives of 4 million children and also pay for all the teachers to keep every child in a, a classroom in Africa. So, Oli, uh, we are not pessimistic about Africa in spite of this slowing growth, but we think, we believe that for Africa to continue to rise, it must tackle rising inequality through these particular ways of maintaining and increasing the investments in people, in our youth, in health and education, and investing in agriculture, small scale agriculture. Thank you. So it's a message we, we, we hear a lot, and we, 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 we speak of ourselves, investing in health and mm. education, the mm. smallholder farmer. But are you more optimistic or less than you were a year ago? Actually, I am still as optimistic as I was a year ago. Because you see, I think it is problems that make people wake up and get serious. As I've said, we've had growth, but growth has been squandered. I, I hate to use the word, but growth has been squandered to the extent that we have a growth figure, but we have poverty increasing, especially in those countries with the highest growth figures. The Congos, the Sudans, the Namibias, huge mineral wealth that is not being, tap, first of all, taxed enough, there's tax dodging, and the resources obtained not being channeled into the sectors where jobs can be created. But if, if now there's a wake-up call, I prob we probably will see political leaders being forced to prioritize and to do what's right for African people. Jennifer, you're our chief economist, as well as heading up our work on inclusive growth. So you no doubt you'll have thoughts and comments of your own on whether the growth and the good years have been lost behind or, or squandered. But first of all, the work you're doing. The optimist in me tells me that with the knowledge that we're now acquiring about how to pull the right policy levers to drive inclusive growth, things could get better. Yeah, I, I'm definitely um, probably one of the more optimistic in terms of uh, what we're able to do. And I think there I echo what Winnie said. Um, look, we've known that we needed to make these changes for a long time. Um, and I agree with Winnie that um, the world has squandered the good times, not just Africa. Uh, we've had many good years. Uh, Latin America, many, many different parts of the world have not taken advantage of that to make the sorts of changes that are necessary to have sustainably um, growing, 
uh, and growing economies in, in a very inclusive way. And let me just come back to that because uh, Winnie did mention some of the key areas that I think are often discussed when you think about inclusive growth. And there is no doubt uh, that education is one very important vehicle. Uh, and so is redistribution and fair taxation. And that's something that Oxfam has worked on a lot. And there's no doubt that, and, and as we've noticed with the Panama Papers, there are resources out there, uh, and it's a question of identifying them and making sure that they're collected properly. But I think, you know, just in terms of the work that we've done uh, at the World Economic Forum on Inclusive Growth, what we've tried to do is take a step back and look at the many things that drive both growth and social inclusion to make a point that there's many things uh, that are good for both. So the two that I mentioned, no doubt, but also things like entrepreneurship, you know, for the creation of new businesses, access to finance. Uh, f especially for real economy investment to create new jobs. Uh, access to basic services, including health, but also transportation. We were just talking about energy recently. This is something that's very critical. And very importantly, and something that I think probably isn't discussed enough, is corruption. If you want to think of something more insidious, both for social inclusion and for growth, uh, that is corruption. It's people at every level of the power that they have exploiting those below them uh, in order to get something now. Uh, and that is not something that is sustainable. So what we're trying to do with the work that we're doing uh, is to have a much less polemic discussion uh, because we're showing that there's things that basically everyone can pretty much agree on. It's hard to say you don't think that entrepreneurship's a good thing or you don't think that access to basic services is a good thing or that you know trying to deal with corruption is a good thing. So I just you know, want to kind of put that on the table, which is something that uh, we've really been discussing a lot. Now, just coming back to the World Economic Forum's perspective on this and also business, because I think a lot of our uh, constituents are business, the reason we're working on this is because the business and government leaders that we deal with are very concerned, uh, and it's become a bottom line issue for them. Uh, so we know that the IMF and the OECD have been doing a lot of research on this, and they've actually been showing, I mean, Winnie talks about it, and, and I think there is an undercurrent of development there, but actually these guys are showing that it's bad for growth. It's simply bad for growth to be highly unequal. Uh, and so this is something that, you know, companies are taking very seriously, because what does it mean? It means you don't have a growing middle class, right? Who's going to spend? I mean, just in terms of mathematics, it's something that is not good for growth. Uh, and so very interestingly, and I would just point to two other things that we're working on. Uh, first of all, just to mention, there's a lot of companies in the US and other places that are taking this seriously and they're starting to actually take action. Uh, so for example, there are a number of companies, including Walmart, uh, but also Starbucks, Aetna, uh, that have been actually raising minimum wa or not ma raising mi minimum wages, they're, they're basically raising wages uh, ahead of uh, policy because they recognize sort of like Henry Ford did back in the day, that if people can't afford to buy your stuff, you're not paying them correctly, you know? And so that it's a good, it's a win-win. Also, uh, Chobani, which is a big yogurt company, recently came out and said they're gonna be doing, um, you know, sort of a profit-sharing scheme uh, with uh, their staff. And again, very interesting, um, you know, activities being t undertaken by private uh, companies uh, in order to sort of address some of these challenges. The last thing I'll just say on this uh, is that we have been working with the Schwab Foundation on social entrepreneurship uh, in order to really start identifying what it is that companies can do, we're, talk, we're calling it corporate social innovation, what are things that companies can do to align their social or environmental activities with their underlying strategy? Why? Because that makes it sustainable. And there are more and more companies that are doing that. Uh, we actually came out with a report a few months ago that codifies that it's a bit of a you know, how-to kit. And, and really, companies are basically coming to us and saying, can you help us to talk to the right people in other companies? Because we'd really like to share practices. Um, so that's kind of how we're trying to, to work on this. Um, and so I just you know, end by basically saying that um, a lot is being done. Uh, a lot of different voices are coming to the fore and, and talking about how it's important. I think Oxfam comes at this very much from a human rights perspective. We come at it very, very much from a business and economics perspective, but we all end up in the same place, mm -hmm. which is that something is broken uh, and that we're all not going to really make it uh, if we don't do something about it. So, uh, so I'll just sort of end on that. And I think you know, the last thing I would say is that both the ILO and Oxfam have been very important partners on everything that I've been talking about. And uh, we're quite excited to continue uh, on the journey together to make things better. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Gilbert, I'm delighted to have you on the panel for, for two reasons. I, I want to hear about your, uh, your work at the ILO, but also I want to put you, cast your mind back to your days as Prime Minister of Togo. You would have had people such as Winnie and Jennifer giving you advice, telling you not just what the problem is, but how to fix it. What are the problems from your perspective as somebody who's trying to implement policies? 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I will start by uh, maybe taking it from where uh, Jennifer um, uh, left it. Um, <coughs> from my own perspective, when we look at several issues, one important dimension is to make sure that when you are preparing your development plan, you want to make sure that um, you really focus on the job rich growth strategies. Because nowadays, let's face it, if you want to reduce the inequality, you need to provide job mm -hmm. to most of the youth. So by making the choice for job rich growth strategy, that is part of it. That being said, a government can come and make a decision that I have a comparative advantage in this segment which will bring wealth to my country, yet it might not be um, the sector that will create a lot of job because of the skill gap. Of course, as a government, you don't want to let that wealth go, you'll bring it. That will therefore bring the issue about the income redistribution, which I believe my colleague, uh, both Jennifer and Winnie touched, uh, touched on. The other point that I, uh, I want to make is the importance of start thinking of moving from the concept of minimum wage to a concept and implementation of a living wage, especially in the rural area. We know in our continent we still have two-thirds of the population that lives in the rural area, and the penibility of the job is an issue. So it's important not to just thinking that because I'm meeting the minimum requirement, I'm, I'm fine. That will not help. Um, Third, uh, third point, we need to make sure, when we talk about the income uh, inequality we were chatting just before this uh, briefing, um, one thing is to talk about income inequality. Another thing is to talk about inequality, to inequality just inequality. So while your strategy to have an inclusive growth might take three to five years or more to give concrete results, it is important for the government to really take action, I believe this is the education health that uh, uh, Winnie was touching on, to really take actions for some minimum social protection flaws. And I will give very quick pragmatic, now to answer your question, pragmatic example. Uh, when you sit in the government, you want to make sure as a minimum that all the citizens have access to healthcare. So the accessibility to healthcare and universal healthcare coverage is an important uh, matter. And on that one, um, is also quite interesting. If you're a multinational or a big company, you arrive in a country, very likely you, you want to make sure that you provide um, enough coverage, adequate coverage to the, to, to the workers. That, but sometimes by doing that, you help your workers, but you may not be helping the nationwide plan. Because most likely your workers are well protected, are in that group of less risky, and therefore the notion of solidarity in the insurance principle will suffer. So it's important that you, through your business associations, you can also work with the government to make sure that they have sustainable plan to have a health healthcare coverage. Another dimension is if you can, if I take my example in Togo, uh, most of the um, foreign investment will want to be in the capital or in the suburb. But we, what we try to do is to create some kind of incentives to encourage the business to also go and settle in the most, um, where the poverty rate is higher uh, in the country, and therefore making sure that you can also create the job at the local level and encourage the local economy to help, um, because the income inequality can be between the 10% the and the, the bottom of the pyramid, but sometimes it's also between the regions, which can lead to po a possible potential social unrest, which we know very well on the continent. And then um, maybe one last point, just not to take too much of the, uh, of the floor. It's going to be important to also think about the government's capacity to deliver the minimum basic services. Uh, this morning in another um, setup, I was talking about the challenge we all um, experienced with the, uh, managing the Ebola crisis. And one of the critical dimension is the capacity of countries in the, uh, in the region to deliver the minimum health services in addition to the availability of the, 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 the treatment and, the, and so forth. And doing so, to, to just to conclude, the point I really want to make is one thing is to work on inclusive growth 
um, strategies that will bring wealth and be um, at, the, at all level of the population, but it's important to associate with that the distribution issues and the minimum social protection floor in a different level. Um, not forgetting cash transfer, a lot of countries are doing the cash transfer now, the school feeding programs. In a lot of our countries, uh, and as I said, two-thirds being from the rural area, when they get old, there's no pension. And just by making sure that people over 65, for example, or over 60, they receive at the end of the month a very minimum um, um, cash amount can also help bridging the gap in those uh, inequalities. Thank you, Jibar. We'll have a quick show of hands to see how many questions there are. Maybe, maybe we have some pessimists out there. Okay, we'll have the, uh, the gentleman there. Kalege, could you please give us your name and your, tell us where you're from. Hi, uh, I'm Kes Kavadi. I head up the Banking Association of South Africa. Just, I just want to pick up on the last point there and some of the points that have been made. We're saying South Africa is the most unequal country in the world today. And yet South Africa has one of the most progressive social policies and social nets. So there's something not telling there, right? Uh, and so I, I just think that, and I want to pick up something that Blanca said as well. We're seeing certainly, I'm quite involved in this current initiative in South Africa between business and government. Uh, because we're in crisis, and so minds have been focused. And, and I'm beginning to see that businesses, particularly at the top level, chief executive level, and we need to work this down, are actually beginning to see the importance of inclusion and equity to their long-term sustainability. If you don't do it, in 20 years' time, you're not doing business. Simple, it's not rocket science. And so I think that we do need to find some way uh, so Oxfam is saying that government must free education so on, business mustn't do it. Business, I believe, is beginning to recognize its imperative to skill people for its own businesses. And somewhere we've got to find a meeting of the minds. Uh, if government regulates properly, collects taxes properly, and ensures that business does business according to those regulations, we can actually get somewhere because we need growth. Businesses create most of the growth. And so there's got to be a meeting of the minds somewhere. And I think that the conversation, in my view, has to change. It, it can't be government and business. I think business, e economics, and human rights, there's no lines between the three of them anymore. And we need to change the conversation accordingly. Thank you, sir. Just pass the mic microphone along. That's right. And we'll take the second question. Hello, everyone. I am Gatlaho. I'm a global shaper from the Khaburone Hub. And my question is, how do we feel we can modify the uh, private-public partnerships model to take CSR into CSI and not have this haves and have-nots? Because um, businesses tend to see CSR initiatives as losing or playing it very strategically rather than investing in um, different initiatives that are already being done on the ground. Thank you. Okay, well, let's start with the, the, the first question, progressive, the, yeah. the, the progressive social policies and the extreme inequality and where to find that middle ground. Well, first, on that question of corporate social responsibility, I don't believe in that. I believe that a responsible company, a company of the future, must look at its supply chain and make sure that the social, the environmental impacts there are positive. So the profit, the financial line, the social line, the environmental line, all must be positive. So gone are the days where you did damage in your production and then did a little project that you called corporate social responsibility. It's accountability in your supply chain and then paying fair share of taxes. That's for me the role of business. Now, coming to the comments from my brother from South Africa. South Africa is coming from a very, very bottom base, a very low base, from being very unequal. So yes, it has some very good innovative policies that help to reduce the gap, but there's a long journey to go. We did a study and looked at the top 10% and the bottom 10%, just after apartheid, and almost 20 years later, we found that the top 10% had doubled their income. The bottom 10% static, no change. 
in their incomes. So there's something there. There are some people on the gravy train, and there are others who are left out. So there's a lot to do. On taxation, the point you touched on, African taxation is very regressive. 67% of the revenue comes from indirect taxes, VAT particularly. We need to shift, place the burden more on those who earn more, who have the shoulders to bear the burden. Capital gains tax, corporation tax, shift to that and take the tax burden away from poor people. I was in Kibera recently in Kenya, slum area. I found these market women. They get up at four o'clock to go to buy their stock for their store. They are taxed there where they buy the stock. They reach the, the slum. They pay a tax to enter their slum. Then they take the stock up to their store. They pay a tax at the store. Three taxes on top of the consumption taxes. We've created this enabling environment for big business and we've passed the burden of taxation to the poor. We need to lift it and pass it back and the opportunities for collecting taxes from those who make the wealth are there. Um, I would actually just, uh, going back to how you think about including people in the process, I mean, South Africa has its own issues and I think a dual economy is, is part of it, but when you think about people being included in the process of economic development and growth, um, you know, the idea is that they actually are part of uh, the real economy, that they have gainful employment, uh, which actually gives them a sense of self-worth. I mean, there's many other things that are going on. Normally, the whole redistribution question, and I agree, you know, with Winnie, it has to be fair taxation, it has to be progressive taxation. Um, that should only have to happen once you've already had a system that is fair in the first place or that integrates people. It's not even a question of fairness for me. I go back to efficiency. If you want a well-functioning economy, you want to be using all the talent. You want everybody to be able to contribute. So I think that's one of the big issues uh, uh, in South Africa and other places. I would say also places like France, actually, outside uh, of, of uh, <coughs> Africa, where I really worry about the sustainability of the model. Because it's, if you're not producing enough and you don't have enough vibrancy in the first place, you're overtaxing and you're not taxing properly, it will hit a wall at some point. And I think that that, so that's why you really have to have a holistic approach. I think that that's really important. And, and then just to go to the question of CSI, and I'm not sure if I, I fully understood, but I, I think, you know, the idea is that that whole idea, and, and I think that's kind of what Winnie meant, of like hiving off your CSI activities and putting them in a department and saying, okay, that, we've got that covered because it's over there and those guys do that. Um, is really passe. And I, I have to say, a lot of the companies that you might even be surprised, I mean, really big corporations are saying that that is just not worth it. And an interesting thing is, and, and talking to a shaper, uh, is that the companies tell us, because we've had a number of workshops on this, you know, with the company saying we really need to mainstream this, it has to be really in line with our, our underlying strategy, and when it's in line with our underlying strategy, it's something that is good for us on many different levels. They say the millennials, and younger who are working for us, they will not put up with it either. So it's not even a question of you know, the consumers who have access to information and are, and are fed up, but it's even their, their employees who are saying, we really care about what this company is doing, and in order to motivate them actually to do their work, this is very important. So it's, it's I, I at least, in, over the t last 10 years, I've seen a massive shift, and, and I really do believe that, that there's something that's changing. Not everywhere, not every company is enlightened, but uh, it is changing. Gilbert, please give us your views. And, uh, I'm very, your, I know we're running uh, run of, of time. What I just want to say, uh, I fully agree with the colleague that CS, for me, even the CSI is, is passé. The, the most important thing, starting by ourselves, the government, and the business uh, and partners, is to stop thinking that what I'm doing is a social action. It is a must. I believe the, the, the head of the business community in South Africa said it. If you want to survive 10 years from now, you want to make sure I'm telling people that look at what's happened in Tunisia five years ago. Yet Tunisia is not the poorest country compared to other um, uh, sub-Saharan uh, Africa countries. So what we say is that either you continue closing your eyes, then it doesn't make business sense. So for me, it's a business case. Thanks very much indeed. Um, look, huge, huge levels of optimism for, for varying degrees, maybe, on the panel. We are running out of time, but I do want to give my friend Collins from New Times Rwanda a chance to ask one more question. Please take the mic. 
Thank you very much. My name is Colin Smoy. I'm a writer with the New Times Daily. Um, what if I said that the report of Oxfam has identified the problem but not the solution? Um, because you talk of um, you you talk of uh, changing the tax policies and end regimes that call for tax in incentives for for big firms, but that is one of the, but the, but that is has been one of the drivers of uh, investments in Africa by some of the multinationals and, and, and biggest firms. So that might, I mean, that is, that goes against what, what you're trying to do overall. So you are right about the problem. I'm not sure about the solution. Uh, Winnie, it's, it's, a, it's a fair question. We're here with Jennifer, the CSI yeah. is taking over from CSR and big businesses are doing, are doing quite a bit. So please no, Actually, on the issue of tax, we're making a lot of progress, and we've been talking to the solution, and we're beginning to see the solution. Even more recently, thanks to the Panama scandal, that was a godsend for us, because it, it just proved everything we had been saying. We, at the time of the financial crisis, the rich countries saw, because of the recession, saw the need to maximize revenue collection, and actually led a process of reforming the global corporate tax system called the BEPS process, base erosion and profit shifting, led by the OECD. Through that process, they've been able to achieve some tax reforms that have increased transparency of flaws and reporting, including country by country reporting, and some of the areas where tax is not collected have been plugged. But Oxfam has been at the case of the OECD, saying that this is not enough. Developing countries who lose the most are not sitting at this table, putting their own tax issues on the table for solution. We fought it so hard that now there is a second round of reforms that is more inclusive, that will include the developing countries, all countries, and that is now hosted by both the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, and the OECD. And through that process, we're going to push hard for issues like harmful tax competition. This, competi this race to the bottom of our countries, giving away the natural resource. We're going to push hard on uh, extractives, which are, and agriculture, which are not included in this narrow set of reforms of the BEPS. But so really, solutions uh, are... I would really like to know if you will agree uh, about this tax uh, um, issue mm. on the fact that, and especially looking at that from uh, Africa angle. Um, first of all, our countries, most of Africa countries, they realize that since ODA has been uh, yes. plateauing, yeah. they realize that you cannot count on ODA for your development anymore, and therefore they need to increase your domestic yeah. revenue so uh -huh. years ago. So now they are struggling to have the best strategy to optimize the tax collection. So when we talk about reforming that, what my question is, it's going to be important to make sure that we also keep that in mind, what is happening in other regions. We need to make sure that it's, it's not only in Africa or only in some countries. Otherwise, you don't want to lose your competitive advantage in attracting uh, some investors. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. In fact, we need a global corporate tax reform because what, what companies, the, the system as it is now was created when business was within boundaries of countries. Now companies cross boundaries. Unless we are able to tax at source where production, where value is achieved, that is where Africa needs to fight. Taxing at source, making sure that these resources are, uh, you, you have sight of the resources collected and therefore the share of, of tax. So it's a global system. Tax havens hurt rich countries, but hurt poor countries more. In tax havens, we have one third of the wealth of rich Africans. $500 billion is sitting in tax havens and tax. That could bring $14 billion tax revenue today in Africa. So this is a global process. But Africans can start by coming together and plugging some of the loopholes, particularly on the harmful tax competition part. But my brother, things are happening. Change is happening. Don't, don't, don't think that this is just talk. Reform is happening, and Africa can collect more. 
And that's a very good message. The World Economic Forum is not just about talk. This always happens. Half an hour passes by, and I find myself wishing we had a twice as much time. Before, at the risk of losing my job, I just want to, uh, for running over time, I just want to ask each of you to give, us one, give, give me one, give, give us one realistic outcome that you would like to see achieved by this time next year. Let's start with you, Gilbert. Um, I will hope that all African citizens having a universal health care. By next year. By next year. By the next five years. By the next five years. Starting okay. from next year Starting for five years. Wow. Okay. Jennifer. Okay. I'm, I'm usually the eternal optimist, but I'll um, have a slightly more nuanced, which is um, a very, very good idea of how to drive finance after the SDG discussions, blended finance, et cetera, into Africa. Uh, to really start to build a lot of these things that are needed. Over to you, Winnie. For me to see African governments come together to see how to uh, reform their tax systems, make them more progressive, less regressivity, and to start tackling the tax loopholes that they can close on their own without waiting for the global reform. Get working on that. Get to work. Something tells me we're going to be talking about this for a while to come yet, but hopefully next year we'll have something more to talk about and progress to discuss. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for those of you in the room and for our audience watching live on weforum.org. This session is now over.